I thank you, uh, Greg. All right, we're continuing our study through the book of 1 Peter. So grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, where Peter is again going to give some practical instructions concerning the marriage relationship. The uh, speaking of uh, marriage relationships, I heard the story of one woman who every morning before she left the home, either to go to work or just go to the store, wherever she went, she would put a five by seven picture of her husband in her purse. Well, one morning her husband happened to notice her putting his picture in her purse, so he asked her, Honey, why do you every morning put a five by seven picture of me in your purse every morning? She said, Well, honey, whenever I encounter a problem at work, I pull out your picture and look at it, and it helps me in whatever problem that I'm facing. Her husband smiled and said, Why, that's wonderful, honey. How, how does it help you? And she said, whenever I encounter a problem or a difficulty, I pull it out and look at your picture, and I think nothing could be a bigger problem than this. <laughs> oh, all right. Now, Peter, this morning, is going to give some practical instructions to the husband who has a wife who is unsaved. Now, last week... Uh, we looked at verses 1 through 6, where Peter gave to some newly Christian wives some practical things that they could do. And also, I gave you some things for them he told them not to do to win their unsaved, unbelieving husbands to the Lord. You'll, you'll remember he told them, Listen, you may be married, look there in verse number one, to a man who is disobedient to the word, an ungodly man who cares nothing for the things of God. He said, if you want to win him to Christ, do your best to stay in the marriage. If he, if he stays with you, you have a chance to, to win him. And then he talked about not nagging him. Don't pester him. Don't argue with him. Remember, he said, you wives, it could be possible that you could win him without saying a word in verse number one through your behavior. He went on in those first six verses and gave them several other things that they could do. He talked about being respectful and being faithful to their marriage vows. Remember that word chase we talked about? Being pure, not allowing anyone else to steal your affections. And then to be submissive or to follow his leadership. And then he went on in verses 3 through 6 to focus on having a right attitude and a right spirit. He even pointed to Sarah as being a model example of showing respect. All right, so well, having giving, given to the wife some practical instructions in the first six verses, we now come to verse number seven. Are you there? Verse number seven. It is now the husband's turn. And in verse number seven, Peter is going to give some things that the husband can do to win his unbelieving wife to the Lord. Look how it begins in verse number 7. And I could title this verse, How Does a Husband Win an Unsaved Wife? Well, look at that first word beginning in verse number 7. Likewise, you husbands. Or just like he said in the first six verses, which is dealing with a wife who has an unsaved husband, likewise, or just like the wives, let me read the rest of the verse. You husbands, dwell with them, your wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. And that's where I got the title of my message 
this morning. Seven things we can do to honor our wives. Honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And I love this verse. As unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, the grace of God, that your prayers be not hindered. Take out your outlines uh, for a moment, would you please? And we'll go to number one. According to Peter, I want you to notice something in this verse. What does he not tell the husband to do in verse 7? What does he not tell the husband to do? Well, notice that he says to dwell with them. He does not say here that he should leave the marriage because his wife is not a believer. Talking to a husband here who has become a Christian, he's telling him, don't bolt out of the marriage. You see, in that culture, divorce was very rampant. In that culture, the, the wife, a woman, did not have very many rights at all. She was treated extremely badly. Women were viewed back then much differently than they are today. They were actually treated on the level of slaves who had no rights. She wasn't allowed to speak her mind. Uh, now, Christianity would eventually change uh, that cultural view, but it was still here in the first century. For example, according to Roman law, listen to this, if, if, for example, if a husband were to catch his wife in an act of infidelity, he could kill her without a trial. But if she was to catch her husband, she couldn't do anything. She had no rights in her culture, much, much like the, the, the Muslim world today, where a husband could uh, get rid of his wife either kill her or just simply send her away through divorce. So Peter is just simply saying, if a husband comes to Christ, hey, don't put your wife away. Don't go out there and think that you've got to find a, a Christian girl and leave the marriage. So what should his attitude be? What should he do? Look at several things that the husband can do. Notice number two in your outline. There's two things here. Uh, that Peter says a husband can do to win his unsaved wife to the Lord so that they can be together recipients of the grace of life. I love that verse. I just love it. Heirs, recipients of all that God wants to give. They, it can be given to both of them to share. So what two things does Peter say a husband can do to win his unsaved wife. Well, look at this. The first thing Peter says is that the husband is to dwell or live with his wife uh, according to what? Knowledge. Or just in an understanding way. Live with your wife with understanding. So what does he mean? He means to do all you can to know her and what makes her tick. And so for a husband to have understanding and, and knowledge about his wife means that he must study her. And that can only come from spending time with her, learning everything he can about her. That means he must stay close to her, talk with her. To know your wife means you know the answers to the complex questions about her. Now, you may say, I know my wife. She has brown hair and brown eyes, and, and her favorite color is blue, and, and I know what she likes for dinner, and, and I know what her favorite restaurant is. But it's more than that. To know your wife means that you know the answers as to what her deepest concerns are what her deepest fears are. And so all Peter is saying here is, husbands, don't cut yourself off from her. Even though she's not a believer, don't ignore her or be indifferent to her. You're to be sensitive to who 
she is. And, and for Peter to say this um, is, is probably a, a very revolutionary thing in this culture for a man to be a Christian and then all of a sudden become respectful and, and sensitive and feeling towards his wife who in that culture had no rights at all. So that's what Peter is asking. Far from abusing her or ignoring her or being indifferent to her, the husband is to be sacrificially sensitive to that unsaved wife. He is to be thoughtful, respectful. Now the second thing he tells, look at this. I love this verse 7. We're going to spend the entire time on this verse. He says not only to give honor to the wife, but what was the second? I mean, uh, to live with them according to knowledge. But what was the second thing? I love it there, underline, give honor unto the wife. Again, what a revolutionary thing in this culture. To show honor unto the wife is to assign her a place of importance. Uh, to honor someone means you treat them as valuable, as, as costly. I came across this story, and, and I've told it before, uh, and it's, it's a little, uh, it's about honoring and, and, and loving and cherishing uh, your wife. It's a little turned around, but you'll get my point. The Bible speaks in Ephesians about how husbands are to love their wives even more than their own life. Evie Hill was a great black preacher. And he tells the story of when he was preaching in the 1960s, there was some racial violence in downtown Los Angeles area. Well, as a Baptist preacher, he preached against the racial riots and the violence that was taking place on the streets by the blacks, even though he himself was black, he wasn't afraid to do that. Well, some of the Black Panthers got angry at the things that Evie Hill was saying. And one night, Evie Hill got a threatening phone call and was told that if he did not stop preaching against the blacks' violence that, that was taking place in the streets, that, that he would be killed. Several other black, panth uh, black preachers had already been killed because of their preaching, and, and they told him that they would put a bomb in his car. And the next day when he woke up, he noticed his wife was not there. He looked out into the garage and the car was gone. He looked out the window and saw his right wife driving up to the house in the car. And when he asked her what she was doing, she said, I just wanted to be sure a bomb would not explode on you, so I took the car for a ride. <laughs> she loved him to where she was willing to sacrifice her life for him. And I think that the problems with many of our marriages could be solved if both husbands and wives were walking with God and, and showing this kind of honor and love towards one another. I think a lot of the problems would take care of themselves. Now, in this verse, it says to give honor unto the wife. I, I want you to write down in your outline just seven things of how you can love and honor and cherish uh, your wife. Um, and, and guys, these, uh, these are God's words to you. Husbands, live with them according to knowledge and, and give, give honor to them. Treat them with respect. Okay, let me fill in those blanks really quick in your outline. I'm going to give them to you really quick here, okay? Number one, be sensitive to her needs. If you ask your wife what she needs, listen carefully, and she'll reveal her needs to you. Then ask God to help you meet as many of those needs as you can. Number two, let your actions as well as your words, show her respect. Don't sit in front of the television while she washes the dishes. My wife loved me, loved me to do the dishes. I did them all the time. I never even got dishpan hands. <laughs> Pick up after the kids, get them to bed. 
um, help, the, help her. She's more than just a maid, a cook, and a nurse. She's your partner. Besides, if Jesus could wash the disciples' feet, you can wash dishes, right? <laughs> Some of you are looking at me. Please don't, don't say that. Number three, pay attention to her when she talks to you. Put down the paper, mute the television, look in her eyes, and respond with more than just monosyllables. Yes. Okay. <laughs> more than that. Next one. Be considerate and use gentle and kind words with your wife. Again, a way to honor them. Because words can deeply wound her spirit. It's devastating when it's done in private, but even more so when it's done in public. A wounded heart finds it hard to give love. Um, so kind words. <laughs> I shouldn't probably tell you this. Heard the story of a couple who had been married for 35 years. And they were talking about responding with the right words. It was night and they were getting ready to go to bed and the wife was looking at herself, was looking at herself in the mirror. She said to her husband, you know, honey, I'm not the same girl you married 35 years ago. I just don't look the same. I have circles underneath my eyes. I have some crow's feet. My hair is gray and thinning and I have flabby arms and I've put on some weight. I'm just not the same girl that you married. Well, she was hoping he would say something to encourage her, but he remains completely silent. Finally, in tears, she says, well, the least you could do is say something encouraging to me. And husband paused for a moment and said, well, at least you have 20-20 vision. <laughs> that, that's not the thing to say, okay? <laughs> Next one. Again, we're looking at seven things we can do to honor our wives, as Peter here is talking. Accept her feelings. You may not understand them, but you need to respect them as real and, and genuine. Never tell her, you shouldn't feel that way. <laughs> Honey, why do you think that way? And all she hears is, you are so stupid to feel that way. That's what she hears, right? So guys, don't do that. And then the next one, accept her as she is without comparing her to others. Whenever you criticize... You're criticizing something, but she hears this. She hears, I don't like you the way that you are. Be different or I won't love you. But on the other hand, if you show her that you love and accept her just the way that she is, she may change simply because she feels free to do so. That's one of the most wonderful things that I had in my marriage. My wife accepted me just the way I was with all my faults, bumps, and bruises. And then lastly, uh, be faithful and loyal, living up to her trust. Remember, Peter talked about it in verse number two for the wife. When he beholds your chaste or pure life. That's what the word chase means. And so for you as men to be faithful and loyal, living up to the trust of your wife, being unfaithful is, is the ultimate dishonor to your wife. So commit to being a faithful husband in your thoughts and in your actions. And so these are some things and. And many wives long for this kind of relationship. And that's what Peter is trying to get across here. All right, number four in your outline. Let's go on. I only have just a few minutes left. How else does Peter say a husband is to treat his wife in verse number seven? Well, the third thing Peter asks husbands to do is not only live with them with understanding, not only to honor them, but to treat her as what? As a weaker vessel. 
is a weaker vessel. So what does Peter mean here to treat her as a weaker vessel? What does it mean to treat your wife as that? Well, let me tell you what it does not mean. It does not mean that she is weaker in character. It does not mean that she is weaker in her intelligence or spiritually or morally. The word weaker vessel is speaking about the woman's physical and emotional vulnerability. It means that the woman has less physical strength and is more emotionally vulnerable. But this is in no means a condescending description. Um, uh, it does not make her less intelligent at all. Peter is just simply uh, telling the husband he must recognize this difference and take it into account. She's not as tough as you are. She may not be as strong emotionally and physically. Now, I know that's hard to comprehend when you consider what a woman goes through when she gives birth to a child. I am so thankful I am a man. <laughs> there is no doubt that a woman's strength when it comes to enduring pain is so much more sometimes than a guy's. It's true, isn't it? They have so much strength, but when it comes to physical strength, actual physical strength, the woman is weaker physically. And all he is saying here, he's wanting the husband to understand that he needs to treat his wife with sensitivity because she's more fragile. She's more fragile. Now, you can beat her at arm wrestling, but you can also crush her spirit with harsh words and actions of disrespect. So, that's a question that Peter here makes us think about. Is this how we treat our wives? Do you honor and give her a place of significance? Is she on your top priority? And do you communicate that both in actions and words? All right, number six. What does Peter say is the result then of both the wife and the husband? From verses 1 through 6 for the wife, incorporating all those principles that he's talked about, and also in verse number 7, what's the result as we put all of this together when both the wife and the husband incorporate these things in their marriage? He says, I love this, that they can become heirs together of the grace of God. What does that mean? It just means that both husband and wife together can get to enjoy all the things that God has provided for us through Christ. Together we become heirs or recipients of all that God has given us through Jesus Christ. We're heirs of Jesus Christ. And then, I love this, and I'm almost done. Look at verse number 7. That's the goal, to be heirs together of God's grace. In verse 7, what promise does Peter give if both the husband and wife will live in this kind of harmony, incorporating these principles in the relationship? And look what he says, that their prayers will not be what? Hindered. What does that mean? It says that God will answer your prayers and bless the marriage, your life. I'll bless your union together. That's what he's saying. And that's the secret to a happy marriage. I know I've said it before. I used to say that the secret to a happy marriage is that you find an a expensive restaurant to go to where the music is romantic, a violinist, and the lights are down low. And the secret to happiness in the marriage is that you go on Mondays and she goes on Thursdays. I used to say that, but Peter is here saying that this is 
the secret to the happiness in the marriage relationship. I love this story. I'm going to close with it and we'll dismiss then. But, and I've said it before, but Johnny Carson, that's a blast to the past, isn't it? When he was on The Tonight Show, invited an eight-year-old boy to be on the program. He was on the show because he had saved the lives of two friends in a coal mine in West Virginia. So he invited this eight-year-old to come onto the show. As he was interviewing him, it was obvious that the kid was a Christian, and he wasn't afraid to say that he was. So Carson asked the boy, he said, son, do you go to Sunday school? And he said, yes, sir, I do. He said, did you go last Sunday? He said, yes, I did. He said, well, what did you learn? Well, we studied about a wedding and about how Jesus turned water into wine. And everybody started laughing. Well, Carson tried to keep a straight face and, and said, son, what did you learn from that story? And the little boy thought for a moment and said, I'll tell you what I learned. He said, what's that? He said, if you're going to have a good wedding, you better invite Jesus to it. <laughs> if you're going to have a good marriage, you should invite Jesus into it. So we need Jesus in our marriages. So if you want God to bless you, to listen to your prayers, then you have to honor and value um, your wife. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Um, Father, I would ask that you um, take all these things that Peter has given to us in this chapter and that we will do all that we can to incorporate these principles that we would take upon ourselves the responsibility of allowing Christ to just live through us, that we might serve our wives and our husbands, teach our children. We want your blessings. And so this chapter has been one of great insight. Uh, bless uh, my hearers this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.